todos, obrigado por uh, estar aquí en esta entrevista colectiva. Y hoy, como ustedes saben, el señor Juan Méndez com completó esa su uh, visita. Eh, él es uh, especial reporter sobre tortura y otros uh, tratamientos crueles, uh, inhumanos o, de uh, o degradantes. Uh, indicado por los Consejos de Derechos Humanos de las Naciones Unidas. Él completó una visita oficial de 12 días aquí en Brasil, visitando encontrar una serie de autoridades a nivel de Estado y de Gobierno Central, del Gobierno Federal, y hoy completa la contraprimisión con un debriefing que está para las autoridades del Gobierno Federal, para las Naciones Unidas, y ahora encontrando los seis de la MIG. Tenemos aquí el señor Fernández y el señor Rafael Francini, que es el coordinador interino del sistema de Naciones Unidas en Brasil, Então, a nossa ideia é, hoje, agora, nessa coletiva, dar a palavra ao Sr. Juan Mendes para uma introdução geral, ele fará isso em inglês, e depois nas, enfim, dar espaço para perguntas, e depois, se quiserem gravar, tanto para a mídia, a rádio, a televisão, enfim, pode sempre a gravação final, podemos fazer isso em espanhol, se vocês preferirem. Y ya distribuimos el comunicado, o sea, ya tienen eh, una versión en inglés y en portugués. Eh, entonces, una vez más, os agradezco mucho por eh, estar presentes aquí. Y yo daría, si más tarde, la palabra al señor Juan Méndez para eh, su presentación eh, inicial y después eh, comenzaremos con las preguntas. Entonces, muchas gracias. Entonces, Thank you and uh, muito obrigado. Uh, I pido disculpas por no hablar en portugués. Uh, but I am the special rapporteur on torture and I would hate to torture a beautiful language uh, in Portuguese. Uh, I hope you understand. But, uh, but I do want to say that even in the question and answer period, if you prefer that I answer a question in Spanish, I'll be very glad to. Um, we have just The delegation and I have just uh, finished a two-week visit to Brazil at the invitation of the, uh, of the government. Uh, and I have to start by saying that uh, I enjoyed uh, absolutely unfettered uh, access to all the places that we wanted to see uh, and to all the authorities that we wanted to interview. This includes private and unmonitored conversations with inmates in several different facilities. Uh, Brazil, only the federal government, but also uh, local and regional governments have uh, uh, fulfilled their commitments to my rapporteurship to uh, provide that, that kind of access. Um, and I, I want to stress that uh, at the outset, I have about 10 points that I want to share with you, uh, but I want to stress that this is a, 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 these are my preliminary findings. Uh, I have made a briefing to the uh, foreign, uh, federal government this morning, and um, my full report is going to be prepared in the next two or three months. We are carrying a great load of documentary evidence that we need to analyze carefully. And so um, what I am sharing with you and the public today uh, are the uh, initial um, findings of, of this trip. Um, first, uh, on the incidence of torture, we receive multiple credible testimony of uh, persons who have been uh, interrogated under some form of duress or even torture in the initial stages of their detention and during interrogation. Uh, it's true that not all uh, inmates that we talked to uh, uh, told us that they had been tortured during the initial hours of their arrest, but uh, a, a high percentage of them did, and uh, they seemed to us to be uh, credible testimonies. Uh, 
what uh, the, 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 the forms of torture more, more use, usually applied in those settings uh, are certainly beatings, sometimes with truncheons, um, some uh, electrocution with uh, ta taser guns, uh, and uh, some suffocation, either with water or with uh, bags uh, placed over the head. Um, but, the, uh, but I think the most significant um, feature is that although we asked uh, extensively, we are yet to find any evidence that these cases are properly investigated, uh, prosecuted, and punished, as is the international obligation um, that Brazil and all other countries, of course, are uh, obliged to do. Uh, we, we know of some cases in which people were uh, uh, investigated for very serious crimes against detainees, uh, but, it, but for the most part, the cases have uh, not progressed or have been resolved with the release of those accused, and in general, we have yet to hear of a single conviction under the crime of torture. Uh, doesn't mean that it hasn't happened, uh, and I'm looking forward to getting more information on that. Uh, but in, in two weeks, we have uh, not found the case yet. Um, the, 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 the problem of it, too, is that uh, inmates uh, readily report to visitors like us and to civil society organizations and, and institutions of control but when asked to formalize their complaint in a legal setting, they are reluctant to do so, either out of fear of reprisals or because they don't just they just don't see any benefit uh, in doing so. Uh, the, it seems to me that, that torture in those settings uh, constitutes now an entrenched and pervasive practice that, if left unaddressed, will lead to more repetition and even to growingly cruel methods. On the matter of cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment, uh, I'm going to refer to prison conditions now more generally. Uh, in most of the places we visited, those conditions do amount to cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment or punishment. Uh, and most of it comes around to the issue of overcrowding. As you know, uh, the prison population in Brazil is 600,000 which in a, on a per capita basis is the fourth largest prison population in the world. Um, the, 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 but even more severe, even more serious than that is that the growth of that population has been very rapid and very, uh, very quick in the last uh, 10 or 20 years and continues to, to grow. The rate of incarceration uh, is very fast in Brazil to the point that some very good measures are barely making a dent on the problem because uh, even those good measures don't keep up with the rate of incarceration. Uh, first, uh, uh, some of the prisons that we visited uh, uh, showed uh, absolutely unsanitary conditions uh, in, in different parts, in cells especially, but also in other common areas. Uh, the overcrowding also affects the quality of the food, not so much the quantity that we could tell, but the quality of the food, um, uh, we, 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 we saw uh, food that didn't uh, look or, or smell as, a, as something edible. And in fact, in one of the most overcrowded prisons that we saw, uh, it, and it's a prison where uh, inmates are not allowed to bring supplementary foods uh, su uh, provided by the families, they end up throwing away the food that they are given. So that's an indication of the quality uh, uh, of the food. Um, Health care has also seriously deteriorated in prisons because of overcrowding. Um, uh, in, in, in general, separation between uh, uh, underage and, and adult prisoners and women and men is uh, clearly observed and, and, and uh, uh, and, and, and takes place. But separation between uh, pretrial detainees and, uh, and convicted felons uh, has also broken down. Even prisons that were meant to one or the other uh, category 
are now mixed up, and even mixed up in the same cell, uh, including mixed up with first offend first time offenders uh, and and uh, and relatively hardened criminals. Um, so, uh, as I said, there has been some uh, efforts to reduce overcrowding, which will I refer in a minute. But even in the places where they have gone the farthest, they seem to have uh, at best slowed down the rate of overcrowding on, and, and increase in, of increase of overcrowding. Uh, for example, in Maranhão, the custody hearings are resulting in more than 50% uh, rate of release, pretrial release early on, and yet the prison <laughs> population remains the same. So uh, one can only conclude that the rate of incarceration uh, is, is so high that it would be even much worse if it weren't for the custody hearings. Uh, health services, of course, in uh, prisons have also suffered greatly. Uh, we visited a prison where uh, the, the infirmary had a capacity for 25 uh, sick uh, inmates in a prison that uh, had the full capacity was 800 and it was holding 2,200 uh, prisoners. In the infirmary, they had 27 uh, uh, sick inmates, uh, so a little over the capacity of, of that unit. Uh, but interestingly, uh, most of the, uh, or all, I'm sorry, all of those 27 told us that they don't see a doctor regularly in the infirmary. Um, in fact, many of the less sick uh, inmates take care of the more sick inmates in that facility. And in many, many places that we visited, the, uh, the authorities themselves told us that they have maybe uh, one or two doctors coming twice a week for populations of 2,000, 2,500 uh, inmates, which is grossly inadequate. I want to mention the, the imprisonment of children because we visited at least uh, we visited one uh, female detention center for under uh, for uh, girls and one uh, for boys. And uh, although the law says that the detention of children is subject to principles of brevity, exceptionality, and respect for the particular condition of adolescents uh, in their development developmental phase. Um, we understand that detention is not used as a measure of last resort, at least not, not always, uh, but that, uh, and of course that detention conditions do not always respond to the specific needs of, of, of adolescents. Um, especially in boys' uh, uh, centers, uh, the approach is much less socio-educational and much more uh, security-related and, and disciplinary uh, in nature. In fact, the architecture itself of some of these facilities resemble regular prisons. Uh, and, and for all intents and purposes, uh, that's what they are. Uh, and, and of course, not only uh, security, but a very rigid disciplinary system is, is applied there that inevitably results in some cases of violence against uh, both boys and girls, even when, where there is uh, no overcrowding. Um, we understand that there's a bill to lower the age of responsibility by constitutional amendment and I think that in addition to uh, by, uh, the, you know, treating 16 and 17 year olds as adults would violate an international standard in the in Convention Against the Rights of the Child, um, it would also be a very um, uh, serious mistake from, the, from a practical perspective because it would only increase the overcrowding. The, 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 the population uh, accused of crime uh, by age groups include many, many uh, in the 16 to 18 category, and if they would just increase the prison population, all these problems that we are uh, referring uh, would be made much worse. We also understand there's another proposal to uh, uh, maintain the law, the, the age of criminal liability at 18, but to lengthen the periods, the maximum periods uh, that to which uh, children can be subjected. Now they, they are at three years, and the proposal, I understand, would move them to 10. 
I mean, uh, we believe that that would also uh, result in more overcrowding, at least of the uh, children's detention centers, which are already, uh, the one, the boys one we visited in Sao Paulo is already overcrowded, uh, and uh, just extension, extending their stay there, and especially in, co in conditions in which these institutions don't serve their original uh, purpose of educating and re-socializing the, uh, the, the, the children there, uh, will only become uh, a, more, uh, a more extensive problem down the road because uh, upon exiting those uh, boys and girls uh, would uh, probably join uh, criminal elements in their, in their community and, and commit more crimes. Um, uh, on, uh, on the bright side, I, I have to say that I am impressed with uh, the way that Brazil gives access to uh, controls, uh, external controls in detention facilities and also to civil society visits. Uh, it's more extensive and more uh, uh, unfettered that I've seen in many parts of the world. Um, uh, public defenders are, uh, can go and, and do go generally to prisons. Uh, prosecutors do the same. And uh, civil society organizations, and uh, uh, in, including uh, well-known and highly respected organizations like the Pastoral Carceraria, have been doing this now for many, many years. In addition, uh, Brazil uh, is, uh, has a great asset on this uh, by creating uh, councils and committees like the National Committee or Commission, I'm, so, I'm sorry, to uh, prevent and combat torture that uh, join state agents with civil society representatives, and uh, uh, mostly on policy formulation, but also uh, on uh, monitoring of the situation. I think this is an advantage that uh, Brazil has over other societies uh, that needs to be promoted. Um, of course, it also results on uh, a great variety and profusion of reports over the years uh, about conditions in detention centers. And it's important not to have, and not just to have the reports, but to, uh, to start formulating policies and acting on the situation uh, uh, as soon as possible. <coughs> um, we, we did visit one privatized facility. Uh, we actually visited some that have some services privatized, like food distribution, for example. But in Alagoas, we visited one that is wholly and completely run by a private company in contract with the state. Uh, except for the perimet perimeter uh, security that is provided by the military police. Uh, the, the, the conditions in that facility were much better than, uh, than we saw uh, elsewhere. Um, and uh, I am not in a position, or no, nor do I want to have a final judgment on whether this is uh, uh, a good option. Uh, I, at this point, I just want to express two concerns. One uh, is that this may blur the lines of accountability for mistreatment in prisons. I understand that private companies fire or, or can fire uh, employees that violate the rights of their prisoners, but that is not enough. Uh, torture and cruel and human under great treatment are serious offenses that elicit from the state an obligation to investigate, prosecute, and punish the event, not just uh, dismiss the, the culprit. Uh, and, and, and my other concern is, again, related to overcrowding. Those, those places are never going to be overcrowded because in contract, contractual terms, uh, companies will not receive any, a single person over their stated capacity. Uh, and that is good for them, but in the, in, if in the same state they, these facilities coexist with others run by public facilities, by, by state, facility, uh, by state uh, authorities, inevitably uh, this will result in overcrowding of the state-run uh, facilities that don't have the privilege of refusing entry to, to people because they've reached their capacity. Uh, 
Uh, again, uh, I think the, uh, the the question of whether this is a, the right way to go or not is something that exceeds my mandate at this point, but I did want to uh, express those reservations, if you will, uh, about privatization of, uh, of prisons. Uh, in terms of uh, safeguards against uh, mistreatment, Brazilian constitutional, substantive, and procedural law is generally in line with international standards and more than adequate to uh, prevent torture from happening or for reacting uh, institutionally as uh, when, when torture does happen. Uh, but uh, the sudden increase in incarceration has strained the physical infrastructure and human resources needed to implement these rules adequately. Uh, it seems, for example, that access to a lawyer from the moment of arrest is not very generally available. Uh, public defenders are very few in numbers compared to the detainee population, and they, ca they can barely keep up with their other functions, such as representing them at trial, even though uh, easily 90% or more of the people incarcerated in Brazil don't have private lawyers, so they need public defenders. Uh, in most of Brazil, arrested persons come before a judge on the average five months after the arrest. Uh, this violates a clear international standard uh, in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, for example, also in the American Convention of Human Rights or uh, Pact of San Jose de Costa Rica, that uh, and any person detained has to be, prompt, has to be brought promptly before a judge to determine the legality of the arrest, to, de uh, to determine whether he has been uh, treated uh, with dignity, and to resolve the question of whether he should remain in custody or uh, charges should be dropped or that person should be uh, subjected to alternative measures. Uh, uh, of course, this brings me to the custody hearings, which I think is a very important initiative. Uh, we heard many good explanations of it. We also heard some uh, misgivings that some public officials have about them. Uh, but we definitely uh, encourage Brazil to continue on the road of, um, uh, of custody hearings uh, that essentially brings uh, the, the person in custody within 24 hours, in, in one state at least in, in 48 hours, before a judge with the presence of a prosecutor and the presence of a public defender, and the ability to be examined by a doctor of the uh, Instituto de Medicina Legal uh, the same day. Uh, all of this uh, looks great, and, there, and the initial results, at least on the matter of uh, uh, reducing the rate of incarceration, are encouraging. There are, there are uh, figures that we have seen uh, are about 40% uh, of uh, release, uh, even under pre-trial uh, uh, release, uh, as opposed to 15% or 10% in some countries, in some states, earlier uh, before the custody hearings were uh, initiated. Um, but as I said before, that uh, also only minimally uh, keeps pace with the rate of incarceration. In um, Maranhão, where uh, the rate of uh, pre-trial release is uh, the, the highest of the five states that have incorporated custody hearings, it's like 51 or 52 percent, uh, and even and the prison population has not changed. Um, so, uh, nevertheless, it's a it's an important uh, fulfillment of an, an international obligation and a right of persons deprived of liberty. I am a little uh, more disappointed on the results in terms of uh, investigating uh, torture. Uh, in Sao Paulo, for example, we were told that of 4,800 um, custody hearings, not a single case of torture has been uh, established as proven. Uh, I don't know if that's because the, the inmate uh, or the detainee doesn't uh, report or uh, if there's some reporting and then uh, there is no evidence. But it does, it, it, does, does, it just doesn't seem uh, realistic 
when we hear so many testimonies about being mistreated that of 4,800 cases, not a single case of torture has been established. It seems to me, therefore, that what is needed is a partial redesign of the custody hearing to make it more friendly to the possibility of reporting um, and, and of uh, establishing uh, uh, the evidence. I don't think it would mean tinkering too much with the present setup, uh, but uh, I'm hoping that those establishing and expand, extending custody hearings would uh, consider uh, this uh, early experiment and try to make them more uh, favorable to the determination of whether torture has occurred or not. Um, I am also concerned, uh, of course, uh, we are in early stages of the process, which is being uh, imposed gradually, uh, but we have to be self-conscious of the fact that only five states uh, have custody hearings at this point, that even in those states, they are not uh, universal because they don't cover the whole territory, at least not yet, and they don't even cover all offenses. The most serious offenses, uh, like uh, people accused of murder or attempted murder, are not covered by, this, uh, by these hearings. Uh, I'm hoping that all of these uh, shortcomings will be resolved in the very near future. Uh, I mentioned, uh, uh, I, 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 I need to mention impunity, uh, and, and I want to be precise on what I mean by this. Of course I'm talking about impunity for torture, uh, because that is my, my mandate. As I said, it's important to stress the very clear mandate. Torture is one of the uh, it used to be the, the unique uh, violation of human rights in, in the international normative framework that elicits an, an obligation to investigate, prosecute, and punish every single episode, regardless of whether it's uh, a, a crime against humanity because it's uh, deliberate and systematic. The Convention on Forced, in, and forced Disappearances of Persons also in, in, in involves that uh, standard. Uh, so when you when you see in, uh, uh, that there are many uh, credible cases of torture uh, that happen and you ask the questions and you don't find either too many uh, cases of investigation uh, and much less of prosecution and even many less of, uh, of conviction, you have to conclude that there is a, a high level of impunity uh, the cycle of which needs to be broken. Uh, as I said, the custody hearings may be a way uh, of beginning to, to break that cycle of impunity, but I think uh, both prosecutors and judges and public defenders uh, have to shake a sense of compl complacency about this and begin in, in earnest the, the process of uh, investigating and prosecuting uh, cases of, of, of torture. I am convinced that uh, uh, impunity for these crimes, and it's uh, certainly Brazil is not the only country that has this phenomenon, uh, is on the one part uh, inherited from uh, the years of military dictatorship in which torture was a deliberate state policy, uh, and that uh, because the police uh, has grown not only accustomed to using these expedited methods of investigating and quote unquote solving crime, but also because they know they enjoy uh, impunity, that they will not be investigated, prosecuted, or punished. Uh, so it, it, it seems to me important to stress that some of the measures that Brazil has undertaken to uh, deal with the legacy of human rights abuses of the dictatorship, like the work of the Commission de Amnistia, the Truth Commission report, uh, and many other initiatives of that sort are, uh, are excellent steps in the right direction, although they certainly have not solved the whole problem of impunity for the crimes of the dictatorship, but they also uh, should be used as an example for uh, actions to uh, break the cycle of impunity for uh, human rights crimes, including torture, that happen now, that happen as we speak, that happen, at, or that will happen in the next few days. 
uh, in terms of criminal law and, and, and procedure, there may be some room for uh, important but not radical changes. 26% uh, of all uh, detainees in, in prison in Brazil are there on drug charges, drug, trade, drug uh, dealing charges. Uh, at the same time, there are very few uh, big uh, drug uh, kingpins uh, in custody. So these 150,000 or so uh, inmates uh, are mostly uh, either very small uh, time uh, drug dealers or even people who uh, are caught consuming and are accused of dealing. Now I know that the law uh, in, in Brazil has decriminalized possession uh, of drugs for uh, uh, one's own consumption, but I am concerned that the way that the law is applied uh, in practice provides a, a broad discretion to judges to determine uh, the, uh, whether there has been an intent to deal or not, uh, rather than using the objective standard of the quantity itself, determining whether it's uh, for, con for, inter for own consumption or for, for dealing. Uh, it seems to me that uh, relying on the presumptive intent uh, also leads judges to rely on the report of the police. And, and uh, the report of the police based on arrests conducted under uh, a very sui generis understanding of in flagrante delicto, uh, flagrancia in, in my bad Portuguese, um, is really nothing uh, like what we learn in law school. I mean, in flagrante delicto means that the agent sees the, uh, the crime uh, being committed. Uh, a policeman that arrests somebody uh, because he looks suspicious and finds drugs in his possession is not uh, acting in flagrante delicto. He's making an arbitrary and illegal arrest. And if the judges are going to rely on that uh, uh, information, uh, someone who should not be in prison, who at best should be treated for drug addiction, uh, is going to spend five, ten months or even years in prison and will end up uh, coming out uh, with no option rather than resorting to crime. So it seems to me that some action in that uh, area uh, could leave room for improvement of all the situations that we're talking about. Um, and finally, my, my final point is about uh, the state of uh, forensic medicine uh, in uh, support of the obligation of the state to investigate, prosecute, and punish. Uh, I have no doubt that the professionals who uh, are employed by the different institutos de medicina legal uh, are uh, conscientious professionals, they engage in ethical behavior. But on the one hand, they're not, in general of course, not particularly trained in the international standards for detection of torture contained in the so-called Istanbul Protocol or in the international standard for determination of cause and manner of death, uh, the so-called Minnesota Protocol. Uh, there's an urgent need for capacity building in that area, uh, but more important than that is the fact that uh, the Institutos de Medicina Legal are everywhere part of the Secretariat of Public Security. So in essence, they are part of the same uh, institution uh, that involves police and military police, civil police and military police. So even if uh, pro each professional operates uh, conscientiously and, and uh, in accordance with ethical methods, the result is never going to be all that credible if the public believes that in fact, uh, uh, you know, policemen are not going to be uh, subjected, I mean, they're not going to be accused uh, and that the, uh, the medical examination will be biased in favor of not finding uh, evidence of abuse. So I understand that there is uh, a bill pending in Congress to uh, conduct a, a constitutional amendment to uh, provide for independence of all 
forensic services, obviously not including only medical forensic services, but all other ones. And uh, I believe that would be a step in the right direction, and I'm definitely uh, going to support it. Um, I'm sorry to have gone on so long. I am willing to, uh, to, to, to take your questions now. Molto, molto obrigado, Sr. Mendes, por esse seu briefing, essa sua informação. Vamos abrir para perguntas. Eu lhe peço que se identifiquem, possam fazer a pergunta em português, se é sempre preferirem. Então, temos microfone. Vamos fazer uma. Oh, olá, boa tarde. Ivan Richard, eu sou repórter da Agência Brasil. É... Então, só para o senhor identificar, sou repórter da Agência Brasil. É... O senhor fala sobre a tortura, eu queria que você, só para ficar bem claro, o senhor identificou então que a tortura é algo enraizado no, nos presídios brasileiros, e a impunidade também é algo que, que caracteriza todo o sistema prisional do Brasil. É isso. E se o senhor tem algum dado que pudesse, apesar de falar que o seu relatório ainda não está pronto, se o senhor tem algum dado que possa caracterizar isso, por favor. Uh, I, uh, I want to say that I find uh, torture in the early hours of detention and interrogation. Uh, frequent, to say the least, maybe even pervasive. Uh, I, I, I'm not saying by any means that everybody is tortured, but the, the number of testimonies we receive uh, and, the, and the consistency of the uh, testimonies that we receive lead me to believe that it's not a, a, an isolated phenomenon. At the same time, I don't believe that anybody uh, in government uh, wants torture to happen, but I do believe that structurally uh, torture happens and, uh, and, uh, and it is uh, left uh, uh, in impunity uh, for lack of action to curb it and to prosecute those guilty of it. I, I, I do make a difference with uh, prisons because in, in prisons we heard uh, numerous accounts of, uh, of, of abusive treatment, verbally, verbal abuse and sometimes physical abuse, uh, uh, sometimes humiliating abuse also, some beatings. Uh, but I don't believe that it is uh, uh, an ongoing practice that, uh, that all inmates uh, suffer. Nevertheless, for those uh, events that happen in prisons, there also seems to be a high, uh, 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 a high level of impunity. Again, they are not investigated, they're not prosecuted, and they're not punished. Boa tarde, meu nome é Laura, sou da Conecta de Direitos Humanos. Queria perguntar o que, que tipo de monitoramento a relatoria é, pretende fazer para verificar a aplicação dessas recomendações. Eu gostaria de saber se o senhor verificou maus tratos ou tortura contra familiares de presos, como é o caso da revista Vexatória. Sim, nós ouvimos testemunhas. Na verdade, uh, mostly from uh, the inmates, not from the relatives, uh, and in some cases from documents that we gather from civil society organizations about the so-called requisas or registros vejatorios. Revistas, thank you. Um, I think that's a very serious problem that I am very, uh, very much part of my mandate because Cruel and human under degrading treatment doesn't happen only to to people de, uh, deprived of freedom, but also to, uh, uh, to 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 other persons in non-custodial situations. Uh, 
we, we heard that in many prisons, uh, even elderly persons are forced to, uh, to, to kneel or to squat. Um, I got chance, that's right. Um, the, we, we, we also heard that they take forever to go through these things, that there's no uh, good metal detectors, for example. No, uh, and, and in fact that everybody in some prisons at least goes through this procedure, whether or not there's re reasonable suspicion that they m may be engaged in smuggling either weapons or drugs into the, into the prison. Now, I do believe that uh, prison personnel are responsible for security and they should, uh, uh, they should uh, in uh, inspect uh, what goes in and what, what goes into the prisons. Uh, but there are ways of doing this in humane and dignified ways. Um, and uh, from what we heard, there's plenty of evidence that in some prisons at least, that's not the way it happens. Boas Eduardo da Ivi da Agência F. Hum, agora o senhor falava das ditaduras e de, que é o que nós latino-americanos vinculamos muito mais à tortura. Nós, nós é, quando argentinos, brasileiros, quando falamos de tortura pensamos em ditaduras, uruguaios. Mas a nossa democracia já tem 30 anos. Muitos torturadores de ontem estão mortos, a maioria. Então, o eh, que acontece com as nossas democracias que não incorporaram ao discurso político dos direitos humanos a realidade dos seus sistemas penitenciários? O... É um déficit do, da democracia, já não é da ditadura. E podemos dizer hoje que as nossas democracias torturam tanto ou mais do que torturaram um, I think in the military dictatorships, a lot of torture went undetected because what was detected was the torture against the political uh, dissident, the opponent. But the torture of poor people, uh, 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 people accused of common crime offenders probably happened as much as or more than it happens now in democracy, and nobody discussed it. Nobody, you know, we really didn't know. It was like an underground phenomenon. Uh, I think the benefit of democracy is that we have a lot of freedom of expression and civil associations that campaign, so we know a lot more about torture. But the sad uh, reality is that although uh, Democracies emerging from dictatorship have done a lot to uh, not only Im Im improve social justice and uh, inclusion, but also to redress the crimes of the past. In one area, uh, democracy has been disappointing, and that is in the area of uh, reforming the institutions by which a state exercises power against its citizens, especially law enforcement and um, and, and crime prevention uh, institutions. Uh, and uh, so many practices inherited from the dictatorship continue uh, in the democracy. Again, it's not the same, uh, and it's difficult to say whether more happens or less happens, or the same amount happens, because uh, torture methods <coughs> seem also to be different. Um, the, the severity and even savagery of some of the torture uh, experienced by political dissidents uh, and even by rebel groups in during the military dictatorship uh, seems to me at least uh, very, uh, very impressionistically to have been much more severe than anything we hear now. Just for example, uh, in these testimonies that I gathered during the week, uh, people would complain of sometimes very severe torture, but that would happen over a couple of hours or one afternoon. Uh, we, we, I did not hear, may, maybe it happens, but it, I did not hear anybody talking about two full weeks of uh, daily torture 
uh, or use of concentration camps, etc. So the things are not comparable, but on the other hand, I don't mean to minimize the very serious problem that uh, the endemic form of torture, to give it a name, uh, that pervades many uh, countries that have made transitions from dictatorship to democracy, and unfortunately they're not limited to Latin America only. Um, uh, they, uh, I don't mean to minimize it, it's a very serious problem, and it's a serious problem for the rule of law and for uh, the objective of a, of a democratic society where we're all equal, equal before the law uh, and, and treated equally by the law. I think, uh, uh, just in, in conclusion, I want to say that my mandate does not distinguish b with the type of government. So uh, I have to try to and protect everybody, and especially the most vulnerable, from torture and ill-treatment. And uh, uh, what, what I say has nothing to do with my judgment about the, the quality of the government and of the system, the, the governance, the system of government that a country has. Uh, mandate uh, applies to uh, all. Buenas tardes, eh, Eugenia de la agencia France Press. ¿Puedo preguntar en español? Por favor. Eh, quería saber cómo ve a Brasil con respecto a los demás países de la región y cuál podría decir que son las particularidades de Brasil con respecto a este tema que los distingue justamente de, de otros países de la región. No sé si se puede decir que estaba mejor, peor, en qué, en qué aspectos está por delante y en cuáles se ha quedado... Por, detrás. Bueno, por mandato de la, del, del Consejo de Derechos Humanos, nosotros no hacemos comparaciones. Eh, hacemos sí comparaciones entre estados eh, con sí, consigo mismo. Es decir, por ejemplo, eh, eh, si, si ha mejorado la situación o ha empeorado, eso sí lo hacemos. Pero con otros países no lo hacemos. Eh, y y eh, aunque es un. un un mandato específico de no hacer comparaciones por parte del Consejo, quiero decir que yo también estoy de acuerdo. Es muy difícil comparar, las situaciones son muy difíciles, eh, terminamos comparando situaciones que no son comparables eh, y realmente no creo que avance la causa de los derechos humanos decir que un país es menos malo que el otro. Eh, así que con todo respeto voy a, a declinar eh, esa pregunta. Lo que sí... Eh, quiero decir que lamentablemente yo tengo, yo tengo supuestamente competencias para trabajar sobre 194 países y no hay ninguno que no tenga algo que mejorar con respecto al tratamiento y a la dignidad humana que, de, que debe eh, garantizarle a toda persona detenida. Eh, ciertamente hay países que tienen una muy buena performance con relación a a, a estas eh, obligaciones internacionales, pero no, no es el caso, y, y precisamente porque no se pueden comparar las situaciones, eh, la, eh, la, la, la actitud de un país eh, no exime de las obligaciones de otro país con respecto a sus propios ciudadanos y ciudadanas. Boa tarde, Gustavo Garcia do Portal G1. É, o Brasil vive um momento bastante delicado é, na discussão sobre segurança pública. É, uma das pautas é a redução da maioridade penal. Eu queria saber a opinião do, do senhor sobre isso e também aproveitar para perguntar sobre a privatização das penitenciárias, se o senhor acha que pode ser uma solução para evitar tantos desrespeitos aos direitos humanos nas penitenciárias brasileiras. Well, I, in my prepared remarks, I, uh, I said something about both of those issues. I'll be glad to repeat them. Um, on, and, uh, on the age of uh, criminal liability, uh, I think reducing the age from 18 to 16, even if it's done by a constitutional amendment, 
would, on the one part, be a violation of Brazil's obligations under international law, and on the other side, in practical terms, uh, it would only exacerbate the, the very serious problem of overcrowding and all the resulting violations that result from the, uh, uh, the very high prison population that Brazil has. Uh, the other question was about privatization. Uh, I want to keep my mind open about whether this uh, is a, uh, uh, in Brazil uh, uh, a, a good experiment or not. We, we did visit one uh, privatized uh, facility. The conditions there were significantly better in terms of health, sanitary conditions, educational services, food than the others that we visited. But I want to keep my um, options open on that. One, because I've seen private, uh, private, um, private uh, prisons and detention centers in, many other, in, in some other countries, and some of them offer very serious problems from the perspective of humane treatment of their detainees. But more importantly, because uh, the, the, there's a real danger that the privatization may blur the lines of uh, accountability for mistreatment uh, in the sense that uh, 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 an employee of a private company that uh, tortures a, a prisoner uh, will be dismissed. But the obligation of the state is not to dismiss him, but to investigate, prosecute, and punish them. And my other, uh, you know, reservation is, is what it is right now, is that it seems to me that these, these places will never be overcrowded because in contractual terms they, they can't receive any more uh, inmates after uh, they fill their capacity. But that doesn't apply to state-run uh, facilities in the same state. So that limitation will only result in more overcrowding or at least less sharing of the burden of overcrowding among other uh, facilities. So it doesn't seem to me to be at least not a solution to, to overcrowding. But I want to stress that I, um, uh, not, I, I don't have uh, a position on the general principle uh, of uh, uh, private versus publicly run uh, facilities. Uh, for me the important thing is that the state cannot ever surrender its obligation to treat every person detained uh, uh, or deprived of liberty uh, uh, by uh, uh, inhumane terms. By the same token, someone can go to a private mental hospital, but the state has an obligation not to let that person be, uh, for example, treated against uh, his or her will, uh, shackled, uh, mistreated, etc. The, the state uh, maintains the obligation to ensure humane treatment even uh, in privately run facilities and not even in, in criminal justice facilities. Uh, more generally, on uh, the, the beginning of your question, uh, I, uh, I have heard that the very quick increase in prison population uh, is matched by the very, uh, the very large pro problem of criminal violence uh, uh, in, uh, in Brazil's uh, cities and towns and, and everywhere. Uh, the point, however, is that uh, uh, dealing with crime by violating basic human rights, even of the most dangerous criminals, uh, is not the way to, to go because it uh, generates distrust in the population of the uh, institutions like police that are there supposedly to protect the citizen uh, and because it actually makes uh, makes it more possible that, uh, that there will be a spiral of violence in that um, you know uh, criminals will resist arrest and uh, in order not to be tortured and will actually uh, you know uh, uh, react violently and kill policemen. Uh, and quite frankly, uh, at, the, uh, at this rate, a lot of people that will be coming out sometime from prisons 
are going to have very few options but to continue in the cycle of crime. So if we're interested in uh, citizen security, uh, what, we, what we have to do, many other things we have to do as well, but one thing we have to do is not to torture anybody. Eu sou Sayonara Moreno, da Rádio Nacional. Vou repetir. Eu sou Sayonara Moreno, da Rádio Nacional. Boa tarde. Eu queria saber, o senhor, pelo que eu fiquei sabendo, o senhor visitou cinco estados, né? São Paulo, Maranhão, Alagoas, Sergipe, esteve aqui, se não me engano, em presídios de Brasília. O senhor disse que não faz uma comparação entre países, mas entre esses estados, apesar de as suas observações serem bem parecidas em relação a esses presídios, aparentarem ser parecidas, Algum desses, estados se, algum desses estados se destaca em relação à superpopulação ou a relatos de maus tratos ou até mesmo em condições estruturais dos espaços? Well, um, first I, I want to stress that we decided to focus on the northeast, among other things because it has been less covered by international uh, fact finding missions in the past, but also because we try to coordinate with uh, the uh, subcommittee on the prevention of torture that is going to conduct, I think, its second visit to Brazil only in October. So we're going to be sharing information and we're trying to cover as much ground as possible that way. Um, uh, uh, it would be, of course, uh, uh, absolutely uh, possible for me to, I mean, uh, uh, under my, the terms, my terms of reference, to compare one state of Brazil uh, to another. But, but quite frankly, I don't have much of a basis to it. Uh, for example, in terms of the uh, custody hearings, uh, Sergipe has decided not to hold them, at least for now. That political decision may change later. Uh, and uh, Maranhão has, uh, as I said, has the largest uh, percentage of early releases due, due to custody hearings. But because the situations may not be comparable because in other areas, um, the, the prisons that we visited in Maranhão and in Sergipe were equally uh, very bad, you know. Um, so, you know, it, it, it would be difficult to compare in general terms, in, in, in specific terms of some of the aspects of my uh, report, I may be able to make some, some comparisons, at least for purposes of supporting good measures that are, that are being experimented with. But uh, as a matter of ranking states against each other, that I don't, I, I, I don't think I can do. And again, I don't think it would be all that valuable. Boa tarde, eu sou o Evandro Evoli, repórter do Jornal o Globo. Enfim, o senhor escreveu um quadro é, bastante preocupante e nada surpreendente para nós sobre a nossa situação. É, eu gostaria de saber, e pouco provável que mude até o ano que vem, quando o senhor deve apresentar o relatório final do senhor. Gostaria de saber que desdobramentos é, podem vir a ter após a apresentação desse relatório. Punição ou Novo Brasil, recomendações, quais são os próximos passos posteriores? Um, first, you know, we can continue to use information until we write the report. Um, we can uh, use information from states and cities that we haven't visited, as long as we find the information credible, of course. Um, so hopefully my final report is going to be a lot more complete than one that I, what I gave you here. On the other hand, we, are, we have a word limit uh, imposed on us by the United Nations, uh, so uh, I don't want to make a promise that it will be a, a very thick document, uh, but I all, I'm also hoping that by then I will have more creative and more uh, realistic uh, recommendations to make in terms of policy solutions. Um, what, in terms of what's going to happen, um, the, the, the 
the, the work of the Special Rapporteur and the Human Rights Council, that is the organ of the United Nations that appoints us, is not to punish or to uh, single out countries. It's as much as possible, at least, to hold all states to the same standards and to uh, offer the services of the international community, modest as they are, to um, the purpose of correcting uh, problems. I'm, I'm hoping that my job will not end either with a visit or with the publication of the report, that, and that for the, term left, for the time left in my term, that it expires in October of 2016, to continue to be engaged with the, uh, with the civil society and with the uh, government of Brazil, uh, and even with state uh, agencies, uh, uh, in order to uh, come up with, with solutions uh, for the problems that I've described. Um, of course, uh, as I said, we will coordinate with other international uh, organs, and uh, I think in the international community, Brazil enjoys a, a certain standing and uh, recognition by the rest of the world. So it, it, uh, even the states uh, that may be alarmed by the findings that I uh, that I include in my report. Uh, are, are going to have an attitude of cooperation, not of condemnation, or at least I hope so. Um, and, 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 and finally, uh, you know, um, uh, other states may be alarmed, but I know that you, uh, as, you prob as you said yourself, uh, some of what I'm saying is known to the Brazilian public, has been known to the Brazilian public now for many years. Um, and this, uh, the situation just merits uh, focused and dedicated attention uh, that uh, maybe has not been there until now. If I make even a very small contribution to focusing attention on the problem, uh, my job as a special rapporteur would be would would be not I wouldn't say completely done, but would go some ways in into helping Brazilians to solve the problem. Yeah, in terms of the next steps, I would just say um, this is these are my, my preliminary findings. Uh, through you, they will be made known to the public generally. Uh, in the next two or three months, we'll be writing our full report. Um, uh, you know, on the basis of all this information, but also uh, of documentary evidence that we're carrying with us, and anything else that we collect from now until we actually write it. And then we'll give it to the government of Brazil uh, through diplomatic channels, through the permanent mission in Geneva. At that point, that report is confidential. To give Brazil a chance to respond in the next 30 days or so, to correct mistakes if, we, if they point out mistakes that we may have made. And then the response of the government and my report are submitted to the Human Rights Council. This will be more or less towards the end of the year, I suppose. It's then translated into the six languages of the United Nations and it's posted for the public. At that time it becomes public. It's posted in the web pages of the United Nations and it's available to all delegations uh, to the Human Rights Council and to civil society representations and to the press, of course, as well. Hopefully, uh, as a ways of generating a good discussion of the report, at the time when I uh, report annually to the Human Rights Council, which will be in the first week or second week of March of next year. That will be the moment in which the, the, there will be the, more, the most focus on my findings and, and uh, uh, my final report uh, and my recommendations uh, and hopefully we can have a good very public discussion about it.
Conecta Direitos Humanos. É, nós gostaríamos de perguntar, porque parte da opinião pública brasileira é, acredita que o tratamento dispensado aos presos que o senhor descreveu é um tratamento merecido. Então, nós gostaríamos é, de saber qual seria o recado que o senhor poderia dar a essa parcela da população. First, I, I need to uh, you know, explain that I'm, I base my findings on international law standards. Uh, in some countries that I go to, the, the public opinion doesn't agree with me, and it's of course their prerogative. Uh, I think in this area, especially when it relates to torture in the context of fighting crime, it is not infrequent that the majority of the population tends to have a skeptical view of the human rights of people under detention. But uh, I cannot and will not be guided uh, by opinion polls on this. Uh, I, I, I wish, however, to engage in the public debate that has to happen about what is the proper way of fighting crime and providing security for all citizens. And I think we have very good arguments that the proper way uh, includes uh, prevention of torture and uh, uh, prosecution of cases of torture, uh, not only as a matter of morality and not only as a matter of international law standards, but, but also, not principally, but also uh, as a way of being effective in fighting crime. Uh, as I think I said, maybe very, in a very confusing manner a few minutes ago, um, the worst way to combat crime is to engage and permit human rights violations because it just uh, promotes uh, more violence, uh, more, more cases of violence, but also increasing level of cruelty and violence by those who we want to control But more important than that, uh, it just generates in the population a sense that we will fear our uh, public institutions, especially law enforcement institutions, but we won't respect them or trust them. Uh, and I think the, 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 the prevention of crime and the investigation of crime has to re rely on trust on the confidence of the population uh, in order to have good access to information, to evidence, etc., and uh, institutions that engage in, 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 in torture, uh, in my experience at least, don't, en don't, don't enjoy that kind of confidence or trust from the population. Um, and also because the cycle of revenge and of torture and violence that that results from uh, permitting or, 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 or allowing torture to go unpunished um, creates a breakdown in the rule of law and in the quality of, of democracy as we live it. And inevitably, it, it also has uh, dimensions of inequality between rich and poor and racial inequalities as well. Uh, so. On that angle, it also violates clear international standards against discrimination. No, he, yeah, he asked me how many words we have for our report. It's exactly 10,700, which is about 25 pages. It's not much, very inadequate. We try to supplement that by other means. For example, uh, you know, uh, non-official, unofficial UN documents. I, I mean, uh, documents that are not official UN documents that are the results of this finding. Publishing op opinion articles, uh, generating discussions, you know, contributing to publications made in country, 
we make a big effort to go beyond these strictures. But in terms of the actual official report, the 10,700, I think it, 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 they also include some short paragraphs on activities for the year and all that. So they're even less, right, than what we can actually dedicate to the, the substance of the report on Brazil is more like 10,000. Am I right? Uh, Felipe Igreja, sou repórter da rádio CBN. Uh, não sei se o senhor chegou a acompanhar, nesta semana o Congresso Brasileiro aprovou, a Câmara aprovou uma tipificação do crime de terrorismo no Brasil. Uh, uh, enfim, foi uma primeira aprovação ainda, pode ser revertida, mas uh, alguns movimentos sociais reclamam que o texto da forma como está pode criminalizar Manifestantes que gritam às vezes contra o governo, que pedem melhores condições de vida, enfim. É, não sei se o senhor está acompanhando essa, essa, essa tramitação dessa lei aqui no Brasil, enfim, se o texto que está lá, se com o texto que está lá, é, o Brasil pode, aí, de alguma forma, infringir algum acordo internacional. Yeah, I've heard uh, of the debate, uh, and I've heard, I've, I know that uh, there's a fear of criminalization of legitimate protests. I have to say that that's outside my mandate. I'm tempted to tell you what I think as a citizen of the world and, of, uh, and as a human rights activist, but I have to stick with my mandate. So maybe if a law like that is applied and it results in uh, mistreatment of people, <coughs> then I'll have something to say. But I can't comment on, you know, uh, what the law, what laws in the country should say, except uh, uh, in the context of the matters strictly within my mandate. Nas Nações Unidas existem relatórios especiais sobre várias questões. Existe, por exemplo, o relator de expressão, um relator especial sobre liberdade de expressão. Eventualmente, dependendo do texto da lei, isso poderá ser sujeito a observações, ou, mas isso, enfim, vai estar muito and preliminar. E nós também temos um relatório sobre liberdade de associação e mobilização, então, estou seguro que eles vão vir, mais ou menos, mais ou menos, na minha experiência, mas é algo que eu não posso comentar. Muito obrigado a todas e todos. Se alguém quiser gravar para a rádio ou televisão, podemos fazer isso em espanhol agora ao lado. Né? Ou aqui, ou seja, enfim, onde preferir, mas vamos fazer uma... Eu realmente quero agradecer a sua presença e suas perguntas muito boas. Obrigado.